let's go ahead and get started. I'm super excited to introduce you all to Taylor Kong. Um, us with EduFlow are going to be hosting this webinar. We were super excited to hear about Taylor's presentation about user experience and improving the learner experience with user design and strategies. And so super excited to hear from um, Taylor today. And um, yeah, we're just gonna we're just gonna get right into it. We'll be sharing a recording after the presentation, um, probably a few days later, as well as a mini course. Um, and just to give you sort of a sense of where you're at, EduFlow is where I work. My name is Tara. I'll just be facilitating in the background. So I'll be answering some things in the chat. If you have some questions, you can drop them in the chat. And if Taylor sees them, she'll be able to answer them, or I'll just keep them for the end, and then we can use them in the Q&A. So if your question doesn't get answered right away, I'll just keep it and hold it close to me. Um, and <laughs> with my role, I'm in customer success with EduFlow, um, the product, and then I also facilitate and the community manager of some courses and some communities. So EduFlow Academy um, is where that sort of magic happens. And it's a really amazing um, opportunity. We have some free and some really low cost courses. So we're really hoping to get some education opportunities, learning opportunities out there for people who, um, you know, you don't need to pay an arm and a leg for those. So today's webinar we're offering completely for free. Um, and we're just excited to have this opportunity to learn and get together. All right, so Taylor, I am ready to turn it over to you. All right, perfect. Well, hi everyone. I am so excited that you're spending some time with me and uh, you can hear me talk about uh, what I love to talk about, which is uh, user experience and kind of the bigger conceptual sense and how that can impact our designs and um, the learning experiences that we create. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. All right. If you can see it, let me, uh, Tara, give me a thumbs up. Okay, perfect. Awesome. So yeah, this uh, presentation was actually one that I did for DevLearn, which is a, a kind of learning and development conference um, that usually happens in Vegas. And um, I'm really excited to, you know, collaborate with EduFlow and bring this to more people and uh, have a space for it so that way you can reference it um, and hopefully try out uh, some things that you may take away from it. Okay, so uh, a little bit about me. Um, if you want, you can use the QR code on your screen to connect with me on LinkedIn if you haven't already, and we can talk and become uh, best friends. Uh, so as your best friend, I'm here to give you all the tips and tricks that I've picked up along the way um, in my you know, professional journey as an instructional designer. I really started um, as kind of what the industry calls as a e-learning developer, um, which is a lot of hands-on in terms of putting content and getting it ready for, a, you know, the digital space, having it consumed on a web page, on a computer, on a phone, on a tablet. And the more that I started to do those things, the more I had to think about, you know, what other experiences are we having in the digital space that we can be pulling and utilizing for a learning experience. So most of us are probably on our phones, on apps, uh, social media, you know, using these tools more frequently than we're using maybe a learning course. And so all of those things, apps and web pages have user experience designers, and yet our courses that are being developed to be consumed in this digital space are sometimes lacking that perspective. Um, so on my team at EPAM, um, I started to just learn as much as I could, um, which leads me to um, my UX mentorship experience. So uh, earlier this year, I participated in a mentorship, which um, in the in the learning and development kind of community, mentorships are such a fruitful way of kind of trying something out, getting hands on, and really learning, you know, from first 
someone's firsthand experience, you know, what that might look like. And so I basically built a project from the ground up with a UX designer. Um, and the more that we worked on that kind of example project, the more I began to see the overlap with what I was doing on my team and the experiences and content that we were developing to basically be consumed on a web page. Um, so now kind of my role on my team is really focusing on bringing that kind of LX uh, perspective to our courses that we put together, um, which means kind of reviewing things, making sure modalities are, you know, the right kind of container in terms of organization of content and kind of just Again, providing a different perspective, especially if you're focused on writing content, building content, sometimes those UX pieces like color or size and placement of graphic or what kind of interaction goes where, how to emphasize content using color or icons, kind of those more design elements can get lost or are more of an afterthought if your main focus is on writing and development content. So it helps to kind of on our team right now have those two different perspectives separated where we can have someone be really focused on content and I kind of help bring in that UX or LX perspective to make sure that, you know, it's creating a, you know, a better experience um, for the learner. So that's a little bit about my experience and kind of what inspired uh, the session. So here's our agenda for today. Um, these are the three kind of main overarching concepts of user experience design that I saw the most crossover with in traditional instructional design. Um, so that's information architecture, visual design, and interaction design. Also, throughout the session, um, I'm going to be referencing a kind of example proje project just to sort of apply these different uh, concepts in a re really quick way uh, so that way we can kind of see what these might look like in application. So our pretend course <laughs> uh, is um, a client has asked to for a course on working remotely that they recently moved, you know, especially after COVID, they've transitioned to a more uh, remote working experience and they need something for their onboarding. So this will be kind of our project example that we kind of piece together um, while looking at these user experience concepts. Okay, so let's start with information architecture. Information architecture, or IA, um, is really about structure and organization, um, in specifically in a way that feels effective and sustainable. So notice that I use the word feels uh, because how things are structured and organized uh, can actually impact our emotions. And a big part of user experience is really trying to think about what someone might be feeling based on, you know, their experience. And so that's where a lot of like, you know, testing comes in and data collection in terms of, you know, did they realize that there was a button that they could click? Or, you know, is it clear that they should keep scrolling or are they missing something? Um, and so a lot of that has to do with how things are organized and structured on that digital space or on that web page. Okay, so for an example, I want you to, you know, imagine a really messy kitchen cabinet. Um, and I'm not gonna lie, one of my cabinets used to look like this. Feel free to put an emoji in, in your uh, screen if you, if you have seen or if you currently have a cabinet in your kitchen that looks like this. I'm not calling you out, I promise it's okay, um, but, what I do want to show in this example is, let's say there is someone who is trying to cook. They're trying to get a meal ready for their family, and they're looking for the right seasoning. They're looking for the right ingredients that are in this cabinet. And at the moment, 
you know, they can't find what they need. They're getting frustrated. They're feeling overwhelmed. And all of a sudden, you know, cooking can bring about anxiety or they just avoid it altogether due to the situation of, you know, this unorganized cabinet. Now I want you to imagine a beautifully organized cabinet. We have clear containers that reinforce the labels that are on the clear containers. Things you may use more frequently are on the bottom so they're easier to reach and things you may use less frequently are on, are on the top. Um, there is more organization and structure to your kitchen cabinet and therefore the emotions that you feel when you're going to cook, you're not getting that frustration. You're not, you know, getting confusion as you're starting to do this task, which is cook a meal. When we're developing something for our learners, we're giving them, you know, this task, which is to grasp information. Take what we're giving you and, you know, learn this information that we're putting into this course, this program, um, whatever your tool of choice is. And so when they're, you know, working on this task, the more complexity, the more things are unorganized or unstructured is going to lead to a more negative or unmemorable experience. The goal here is to create a really smooth and clear experience for the learner so that way they, it doesn't get in the way of what they're trying to learn. And so this, this example shows I'm on Pinterest way too much, um, but also that when we see things like this or when we look at a web page that's really beautiful, it's not just pretty, it's really thoughtfully designed um, with specific things in mind. So, before I get into what does this mean for instructional designers, I want to show a quick um, example. Um, well, a couple examples that I saw online that were just like really uh, astonishing. So I wanted to kind of pull these up and get the conversation going around. What does this look like for real user experience designers? So this is an example website of yet for Yale, their, their actual website for their school of art. And there are a lot of things happening here. We have, you know, this kind of accordion here. We have things that are kind of in containers on the side. Um, and I'm not even gonna get started on the color or font yet, um, but just in terms of organization, we have kind of columns and different things happening here and how it's presented overall is a little bit overwhelming. Yes, Jesse says <laughs> that website makes me anxious and me too. Um, and so <laughs> in the contrast, I wanna show um, an, an example of a website where the UX designer is using containers in a more thoughtful way that's less um, overwhelming. And this website, I just found by using this tool Dribble, where a lot of uh, UX designers and creatives upload different examples of web pages that we can use um, for inspiration on our courses, whether that be for colors, layout, um, anything that you might be able to pull from inspiration of other things being created in a digital space and apply it to your, your own designs. Um, but for content organization, I just wanted to show that the first thing that, that they have here is who they are, what they are, very simple, very clean. And yet as you scroll, you have this really cool animation for excitement. But this is really what I wanted to highlight here. Um, their approach has basically tabs. And if you've built content in kind of a tool like Rise or maybe an LMS, tabs and accordions are kind of a really, uh, a really common container to organize content. And so here they have, you know, organized this information in a way where you have graphics animating alongside, but it's not 
all in your face at once. You can kind of click through these tabs. Each tab has a similar amount of information. If you notice not one, like create doesn't have, you know, three, you have to scroll three times and then get all the way back up to hit the next tab. They're similar in size. There's not, you know, a large number and you have a nice graphic to accompany that interaction. So overall, this kind of structure or organization of this content feels really clean and not overwhelming as opposed to that Yale example where everything is kind of all over the place. So this is this is our messy cabinet <laughs> example. So to put that in the context of instructional designers, um, what this means is when you're putting things together, when you're putting a program or a course, you can think about information architecture on a few different levels. The most macro kind of being, you know, maybe your topics. So those are your sort of main pages or your main headers. Um, all the way down to the micro way of organization, which is specific interactions that you're choosing for those sections or specific graphics that you're choosing to highlight or emphasize different points. So information architecture can happen at multiple different phases of the program or course development process. And so we can pull what UX designers do when they're developing web pages and apply it to different phases of the, the program development process. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, our example course from our fake client um, about an introduction to working remotely. So our client has given us the following topics that they would like to discuss in their course about working remotely. And so right now, what we're looking at is our messy cabinet. It's just a list. There is no rhyme or reason to where things are. We don't know where things go. We don't know what's prioritized. It's just a list. And the way it's currently organized doesn't really have structure. So we can apply information architecture even at this level. And so I'm going to, I have some ideas in terms of structure that I'd like to apply to this list. So this is kind of how I see this program being broken up in terms of topics. Now, if you maybe have a different idea on how these can be organized, that's totally fine. Um, one of my favorite kind of things to say as an instructional designer is that there's always more than one way to do something. So, you know, if, if your structure for this list was a little bit different, that's great. The important thing is when you are making sense of that messy cabinet, there is justification and um, reason for your structure that you can explain to someone um, and even have a dialogue. Let's say someone has a different perspective and you can kind of get the conversation going around what would be the most beneficial for the learner. Um, and so, you know, in this example, my kind of justification is, you know, the first section is just very introductory. It's, you know, explaining what remote work even is and why the company offers it. Um, next is a little bit more specific and kind of quick tips for your working style or organizing your day that someone might reference more regularly. Um, the third section would probably be more company standards, a little bit not exciting. But the last section, I wanted to end with work-life balance and embrace the perks of remote work to hopefully end the course or the program um, on a high note by having, you know, highlighting these benefits. So that was kind of my uh, reasoning for how I organized this cabinet. Uh, if you guys have any other, you know, ideas, or if you would, if you would switch, you know, the order of the different sections, definitely feel free uh, to share it in the chat. Uh, but this was kind of my initial idea for this list. So some quick tips for implementing um, information architecture on your projects um, include really 
having a strong outline before writing your content and explain it to someone. Chat with a colleague and be like, I think this makes sense. Can I run it by you? They may offer a different perspective that will allow you to shift things around and really enhance the learner experience just through structure and organization. Think about how you want to group your content into the containers that make sense. So this may be headers, subheaders, callouts, interactions like tabs, accordions, carousel. It really depends on what the content is, how long it is, how many items are, are in that area that will affect how you're going to structure and organize those items. Use a consistent hierarchy to convey the organization of ideas. If you're not consistent in your organization, it can get confusing from lesson to lesson or course to course. So making sure that your main headers, your subheaders, or anything else is consistent throughout will help the learner not have to question or hesitate when they're looking at different topics. It's just all the same. They're already familiar with it, and they can keep, and they can just keep learning. <laughs> um, and the last quick tip is to find ways to reduce clutter and long pieces of text to limit to the complexity of your formatting. So this kind of brings us back to that Yale website example where there's just like long amounts of text um, just in, in a way that feels really messy. You can reduce the amount of text like our positive example by using a type of modality. So they used, um, I was going to switch to it but the Zoom thing is up. Okay, so here they limited the kind of just long text that you just have to scroll through by putting it in this type of container and pairing it with graphics. Also, um, I'm going to have uh, a QR code and I know uh, we'll have it added to the, the course on Eduflow, but I have a PDF with all of the quick tips compiled um, so that way you can try some things out on your projects. Okay, before we get into visual design, uh, everybody give me an emoji or write in the comment, how, how are we doing so far? Uh, information architecture is one of my favorite topics, um, but I just wanna get a quick pulse check. Did we have any aha moments, anything that we're really excited about? And if there's something you wanna share, um, you can definitely raise your hand and I'd love to hear from you. Oh, I'm getting some really great emojis in the chat. Perfect. Yay. I'm gonna have a quick sip of water and then we'll get right into the next, the next topic. All right. So visual design is a very large topic um, and it encompasses a lot of different things and a lot of different pieces. Um, it really, you know, is emphasizing the aesthetics. It's kind of not just one thing, but how all of the different pieces work together. Um, so this could be images, fonts, you know, colors and other design elements. So here are some of those elements. Um, we have balance, color, contrast, negative space. These are really kind of the core elements of visual design. And I think a lot of times for instructional designers, there is a misconception that graphic design is the same thing as visual design. So graphic design may be a specific you know, element. Let's say it's your icons or your images that you're using on your site but the visual design is the entire site. So let's go to that website example that I was using. So the visual design is everything we see on the page from the button to these sort of clickable elements to the purple, the graphics, everything on here contributes to that visual experience. However, graphic design is specifically just the graphic we see on the page. So that's, you know, the way that they've styled the people, the way it looks hand-drawn, um, the, you know, the fact that it's only black and white. This here is graphics, you know, and how they're put together. The visual experience is really everything on the page. 
And so when we're thinking about things and the, the page as a whole that we're putting together, sometimes, you know, we don't have control over the graphics, you know, especially if you're working with a client or maybe you have some legacy graphics, things that maybe, you know, look outdated or the maybe the client branding is just hideous and it's just terrible. Um, in those cases, you're kind of limited when it comes to color or the style, but, but, we do have some things up our sleeve that we can still utilize to create a positive experience. And so those are the things that I want to highlight today, um, which is, you know, kind of how can I, how can I still create a positive visual experience, even if the branding or even if the graphics are ideal. And so that's by focusing on balance, emphasis, size, hierarchy and negative space. So I want to think about another kind of example. And here we kind of have what you would typically see for kind of planning a room, a floor layout, uh, a floor plan. Um, so um, imagine you've just moved in somewhere or you're refreshing your living room um, and you are trying to decide where to put pieces of furniture or what new things you need to buy. And so when you are thinking about a room and what to put in it, you have to think about how many people are going to be in the room. What's the main function of the room? Are we sitting? Are we working? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. How do we how do we work with this sort of fireplace? Do, do people want to sit near it? Are we where are we positioning a television if there's a TV in the room? And so there's a lot of questions that go into where you're placing furniture to make sure it's functioning for your specific needs. And so we kind of user, user experience designers use this same kind of idea when designing uh, websites or apps. And so what does this look like for them? Well, it's wireframing. Wireframing is a really, you know, um, kind of strong practice for user experience designers. So they can kind of get a feel of how things work together. Again, feeling is a really big thing to kind of highlight here in the sense that it's going to bring up emotions, even if you're not noticing them. Um, the learners are going to feel things and notice things and, you know, experience what it is that they're looking at. And so user experience designers take the kind of idea of, you know, putting a room together and translate it to how can I create this this visual experience, this visual space, and where do I put things? Where can I put this image? Or where's the best place to put this button so that way people definitely see it? Um, and so that's kind of the, the crossover between, you know, how we can visually create a positive experience, even from the initial stages of a project. So what does this mean for instructional designers? Well, visual design, like I said, is a lot of different things. <laughs> um, and not all of those things we have control over, but there are things that we can do to emphasize certain points, to create balance on the page, um, and really think about it like we're designing a room and thinking about where to put certain things that benefits the content. Because when we're creating learning experiences, our content is really important. We've probably spent a long time working with SMEs, making sure that it's you know, being communicated in the right way. And so visual design can often highlight and complement our content um, when, when used uh, appropriately. Okay, so let's take a look at an example of what this could look like for uh, our client course. So if you remember, this is our kind of structure that we put together earlier. And I have an idea for the your home setup section where I think we can tie in some visuals in a way that will really strengthen the content. Okay, so here's kind of what I've put together for 
the basis of my of my client course. Um, and for the your home setup section, I have a literal picture of a home setup. And this may seem obvious, uh, but you'd be surprised how many times instructional designers miss the opportunities for these obvious ads when it comes to imagery or visual design that really complements the text. So when we have images that align with what we're reading, it creates harmony for the visual experience. And so it may seem really obvious to us, um, but for example, you know, this could have been a list, you know, I have it kind of as a hot spot kind of interaction, um, but it could have been a bulleted list and it would have, you know, done the job just fine, but it's a missed opportunity to create that harmony by utilizing photography. You could have a graphic here um, as well, but kind of, again, complementing your content. Okay, so here are some quick tips on how to be, you know, channel, channel, <laughs> channel your inner uh, UX designer when implementing uh, visual design in your programs and courses. So really think about size and position. Um, these design choices can enhance or detract from your content. Um, text is also a visual experience. A lot of text with nothing breaking it up can increase visual complexity. Um, and it, the, the design can tell our learners what to focus on. So call out specific colors, things that you use over and over again to emphasize a certain point throughout um, can be really memorable as well. And lastly, uh, sometimes the obvious additions aren't so obvious. Uh, so think of ways to complement and strengthen your content with images or graphics that align to your text. Okay, we're getting ready for the third and final section. I'm gonna grab another sip of water because I am chatting quite a lot, um, but I'd love to get another pulse check uh, with some emojis in the chat, or if you're having any thoughts, feel free to raise your hand. I'd love to hear from you. Um, I'm keeping an eye, I'm seeing thumbs up, clapping. I'm so happy that you guys are, are feeling that because that is exactly how I felt when putting it together. I was like, we can totally utilize this. Oh, I see someone has their hand raised. Um, oh, we've got two people. I, I'd love to hear from you. Hey, hi, uh, this is Mr. The site. Uh, I, I don't, I have a query actually. I, you know, in one of my last project, uh, the con, I mean, in, at the initial stage, it was discussed that it was hardly about uh, 45 minutes of four or five courses. But uh, until I have checked the content, it was, it came out about uh, 49 courses of one hour each. So when we have a lot of data, I, I still like, you know, there was a time that uh, due to deadlines and everything, uh, my creativity uh, was flushed and I was just developing uh, the way I mean, something like the basic uh, design or even if it is the, the you know uh, to describe the huge topics what I was doing in the rise and the authoring tool was rise and I was just uh, developed some of the uh, infographic and try to made it easy but still I still have that uh, like you know I uh, you know when I go back to my uh, memory that I think I can I, I would have did more better than just adding some random infographics uh, to it. So, but yes, uh, what do you do in that kind of situation and how you actually keep your mind calm and keep the infographics, I mean, like, you know, uh, keep your ideas and visualize it better? No, yeah, that is a great question. And I feel like whenever you're doing, whenever you have like a long list of courses or programs that need to be completed, uh, it can feel overwhelming to think about, okay, I, I need to try and, you know, incorporate and channel my creativity on all of these different pieces. Um, I think, you know, for at least for our courses, a lot of that is established upfront. 
So that way we don't need to really think about it each time we put a course together. If there are specific elements and custom elements that we need for a certain lesson or a certain section, we collaborate with others to kind of bring it together as, as quick as we can. Um, but it depends on the time constraints. If you can establish your visual design or your visual aesthetic ahead of time, so your colors, if you're going to use photography, so I know for Rise, you have access to, you know, like a, your the content library of photography versus, you know, a style of graphic, um, you know, kind of getting a mood board, either in PowerPoint or another tool, just kind of giving yourself some boundaries. So that way each lesson, you don't need to kind of panic about all the different options you have. You're kind of being consistent with all of the different courses that you're making. And you can kind of limit it to a few different visual design elements and then use them consistently throughout. Um, that's kind of what we've done on our projects, but definitely don't feel like every lesson or every course has to have, you know, this, you know, amazing visual component. For example, in the in the website we're looking at, this is very simple. There's there's nothing, you know, and there are some really cool sites that do implement that, but I'm saying if you are on a time constraint, simplicity doesn't always mean it's a negative experience. Sometimes the content calls for simplicity. Um, so that's kind of how I would approach it. Uh, and I, I hope that's helpful. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you again so much for coming off mute. And thanks for sharing some emojis of how you're doing so far. I think uh tara give me a thumbs up if we're good to go to the the next section okay perfect so let's talk about interaction design so interaction design is more one of the more obvious crossovers between user experience and instructional design in the sense that when we're creating an interaction, we're really thinking about how a user or a learner is engaging with, you know, the interface or the digital space. So that's scrolling, clicking, um, dragging, you know, uh, all those different actions. And so at least for me, starting, you know, in the instructional design space, really focusing heavy on e-learning development, my first real tools were, you know, Articulate Storyline and Captivate. Um, and it was a lot of designing basically these small interfaces with buttons or things that we were asking the learners to do to engage without having a real understanding of, you know, user experience design and how that may apply to a specific interaction. So my example for this one uh, is, you know, something that I got recently, which is a pair of uh, AirPods Pro. And when I paired it with my phone, it made me more excited about the headphones. So um, Apple and their user face and their user, ex user experience is probably one of the most successful um, that, there, that there is um, globally. And so what they've done specifically with this example is taken something really mundane and made it an exciting interaction. Um, and so we have moments in our courses where we can include interactions that aren't necessarily, you know, a quiz or a game or something, you know, that requires them to be graded, but an interaction that can increase engagement and excitement, especially for instructional designers, like I, I feel like gamification, you know, those kinds of words are, are buzzwords when we are thinking about course development. And, you know, they're, we're usually the ones building them. So um, thinking about ways to create this engagement and thinking about how to pull in that user experience perspective can really enhance our own designs and what we create. So what does this mean for instructional designers? It 
kind of like I said, we can incorporate interaction and interaction design in more than one way. So sometimes we are limited based on the LMS or the platform that we're using um, to a certain extent. So usually in this instance, that's when we're kind of pulling in the storyline or Adobe Captivate to build a kind of custom interaction that maybe our platform or the LMS or a tool like Articulate Rise doesn't have. So we're, we're integrating this kind of um, specific experience to help, you know, enhance the content and, and we're building it you know, from scratch, or we're building it maybe from a template, but thinking about how we can incorporate more moments of interactivity that aren't your accordions, your carousels, your tabs that they've probably seen a million times, you know, throughout the course in terms of just organizing information, but how they can actually like get in there and really create something custom and memorable about your course. Um, so let's take a look at our example course, um, working remotely, and I'd love to share an idea that I had uh, for this course. So here's again our structure from earlier that uh, we put together, and I have an idea for the organizing your day section. Um, I think I could create, you know, we can create some kind of interaction to, to complement the content being discussed in this section. So what I'm thinking for this interaction is it's kind of a play on, you know, organizing your schedule. So the section is called organizing your day. And when you work remotely, you are gonna have, you know, meetings you can't get out of, you're gonna have probably maybe some project syncs, but you also need to schedule things like lunch, <laughs> maybe a quick break to you know get outside, go for a walk. You have some flexibility in terms of your schedule that you maybe wouldn't normally have when working in an office. And so how do we transition people who have never worked from home to remote work and create something that's just a chance for them to engage with what this might look like. So my idea for the interaction is just for people to really drag and drop different items into different time slots. Um, and there's no right or wrong answer to this interaction. There's no points, there's no game, there's no quiz. It's strictly just you know, a moment to enhance the content and allow them to engage with it in a different way. So again, this is kind of like a second screen of a similar point. They drag and drop different things that they have control over throughout their day. And they start to see that, you know, I can't have lunch at the same time every day because I, I might have some meetings or, you know, things might come up. And so you really have to adjust and be, you know, you know, uh, agile in how you plan your day when you work remotely. So this was just my brainstorm. Um, a quick PowerPoint mock-up can really help uh, just kind of see what it is you're thinking. And so before I even get into the development phase of this type of interaction, what I would do is make sure that my branding and my kind of um, UI interface of the interaction I'm building is consistent with what I already have in Rise, since it's basically just going to be plugged in. <clears throat> So I've made sure that my buttons match the buttons in Rise, that my colors are consistent. So that way, when we do integrate this, this custom interaction, um, it feels a part of the course. It's not jarring. It doesn't feel out of place. If, in any, if anything, it's exciting. And so this kind of just helps me make sure that my what I am building is consistent. So here's an example of what that might look like. My rounded rectangles are now sharp edges to be consistent with rise. I've updated the colors um, and that's, that's about it uh, for this type of interaction. Um, and there's a lot of different ways that you, know, you can make this look, but um, the main thing to think about here when creating a custom interaction or interaction design is how you can be consistent with wherever it's going. So here are some quick tips for interaction design if you are building something to enhance your courses. Uh, start with a mock-up. 
uh, it can save time. So that way you're not, you know, struggling over the different pieces to put together, or you have maybe variables or specific things that are happening in your interaction that can kind of get complicated if you're still sorting out what the idea is. So I always start with a mock-up, which is really similar to what user experience designers do that we talked about earlier, which is wireframing. Um, have a list of questions you can refer um, back to about the user experience that you can check against your own work. Um, so some of the questions that I have on this are like, do all my buttons have a hover? You know, usually when buttons have a hover, it signifies that they're clickable. Um, you know, do I have an X in the corner to close something out? These are really common things that you see in all web pages or tabs that a user would be really familiar with. So kind of pulling from their experiences in other places in the digital space and making it consistent with your own interaction. Um, Get feedback from colleagues and test your designs. Uh, this is another really you know, important thing that user experience designers do. Um, they get feedback. And so sometimes we don't have access to you know, our learners as they're maybe not as accessible, but we can ask our colleagues, hey, can you try this out? Let me know if something wasn't clear. Um, and I always get a lot of really good insight when I share my initial designs with people. And lastly, ensure consistency in the visual aesthetic of your designs for a seamless experience. Again, that ties into just making sure that the branding of your course is consistent with the branding of maybe your custom build. So let's take a final look at our example course now that we've implemented information architecture, visual design, and interaction design. Now we have something we can show the client. Even without it being really fully built out, we have a solid structure. We have you know, ideas for visuals and aesthetic, and we even have some custom interactions, which usually can get people really excited. I feel like if anyone here is like, ooh, there's this like, you know, interaction we can put in, um, it, can, it can usually lead to some excitement. So by thinking about these three things, it really helps to ensure that we are channeling that user experience perspective at a very high level. Again, you, we can drill down to specifics when it comes to course creation, but these overarching principles apply really broadly throughout the instructional design process when, when putting a course together. I'm gonna have a quick sip of water. And then I think based on the time, we can probably open it up for some Q&A. Tara, what do you think? I think that sounds amazing. Thank you so much. You've been doing amazing. If anyone wants to say thank you in the chat right now, feel free. We'll do another thank you at the end um, <laughs> of the Q&A. But this has been super helpful. The chat's been very lively and it's been really fun to see people are sharing resources with each other. Um, and like, I can see how the conversation could so easily continue. Um, yeah. Yay. So thank you so much. We love it. So I do have some questions for the Q and a, um, before we jump into that, I'll just share, um, a lot of what you've been sharing has been very applicable to the role that I have in EduFlow Academy. Yay. So I'll just do a quick plug. Um, anyone who's interested in EduFlow Academy, we have a bunch of courses. A bunch of them are free. We have two that are cohort-based. So you get to experience the course instead of self-paced where it might be hard to motivate yourself. You get the chance to experience the course along with some other people. One of our most popular courses is Instructional Design Principles for Course Creation. And you actually design a course. And so it's a really great opportunity, especially if you have an upcoming project that you need to work on to just like bring that project to us and we'll help you through it. Um, you also have a chance to join the EduFlow Academy community by participating in some of our courses. And um, Taylor, you mentioned like reaching out and asking for feedback. And that's a really great place, especially if you don't have the biggest L&D team. Maybe you're a micro team, maybe you're just one person. And so that's a great resource if you need someone to just ask for some feedback. Um, so you can find that we actually have a course on if you're a micro L&D team, um, go to eduflow.com slash academy and you can check out that course. That's a free one. So that's a really good one. 
Um, and I've been saving some questions. And so I'll, I'll show, I'll send you one of the questions we had was a really great one. Um, I mean, all of them were great, but one of them there was asked twice. So I'll definitely pop that in. And then after that, we can have a chance to, if anyone wants to like raise their hand and ask questions or ask in the chat, we could do that. So the first question that I thought was really important, I'll pop the two questions into the chat. Um, they were asked at different times too. So this is definitely something that's super relevant um, is how does accessibility and user accessibility kind of fit into the best practices when you're designing the visual of the learning? Yeah, th this is a great question. And I think I can kind of see accessibility playing into really a, all three of the areas. Um, specifically, if we're thinking about visual design, obviously, you know, we want to make sure that the contrast is high enough. You know, there are definitely some resources to to work with when thinking about how can I make sure the visual design is accessible, mainly in regards to text. So if you're using color for different you know, text, you want to make sure that that's readable. Everything else is kind of just to enhance like the mood and the feeling that you get. It's a very, you know, like uh, if you have sharp edges versus soft edges, you know, it kind of all impacts the emotion and the subconscious when we don't even realize it. But for user accessibility, I think the big thing to pay attention to is just contrast when you're using text or creating diagrams, especially if you're working with really technical content and you need to create diagrams that kind of show different processes. You may be using different colors behind or, you know, with text. Um, so I see that, you know, playing in a lot there in terms of visual design, but as well as when you're creating custom interactions, if it's a drag and drop, you know, drag and drop interactions typically aren't the most accessible just because, you know, depending on how fine the motor skill is that we're asking them to do, you want to make sure that whatever we're asking them to click on is a big enough click and clickable space. Um, there are a couple of different resources that I can share, but really it's just referencing those and thinking about how can we best implement them into the design. Uh, sometimes, like I said, with brandings, you know, sometimes we don't always have the choice, uh, but you know, of, of the font style or the colors, but just making sure it's being implemented in a thoughtful way. So there are definitely web you know, websites and things online that let you test out different color combinations to make sure the contrast is high enough. Um, and I think there's a resource that sh that states like how many pixels a button needs to be to be accessible so that way it's big enough, there's a big enough space. Um, so yeah, I will, I can search for those and Tara, I will, I will send those so we can include them in the course as well. Perfect. Yeah, we'll definitely put those into the course. Um, speaking of that, we had a lot of questions about if a recording will be shared. We'll probably take at least a week to get it all put together, but we're going to put some resources in there for you, um, some opportunities to engage with each other and continue the discussion. And so you'll probably get that next week. So don't worry if it's not like tomorrow. <laughs> um, there was another question. And then after that, I'll open it up to um, anyone to ask a question either live or type it in the chat. Um, but another question that came up was differentiating courses while being confined to a highly templated authoring tool, maybe because of the branding or maybe because of the tool. Yeah, this is a really great question and it's a lot of fun. Um, I think, I think when we are using tools like Rise or tools that are really plug and play, they're meant for you to upload content, upload an image, you know, the goal of them is to make it easier for us as instructional designers. However, it can, you know, be kind of stale over and over again. So thinking about how to differentiate or create, you know, some uniqueness between your courses is actually a lot of fun. And that's kind of where I want to encourage you to look outside of typical learning experiences and pull in inspiration from those other places. So like Dribble is a really great resource. Uh, even I'm a big fan of Canva, um, which is a tool for like, I used it to create my presentation today, as well as a couple of other things. Um, 
Behance, I think, is another website where creatives are sharing things. And so even your phone, like take a look at like what are the top like 10 apps in like product, uh, you know, task organization, or like think about things that you always use that you really enjoy and how to bring that into a course or, you know, how to create a, something similar. So continue to be inspired by your digital experiences in other places, as well as what creatives put out there. And and find little moments to incorporate it not and not don't use it every time so that way there there is uniqueness between your courses um but just continue to to pull from from your different experiences that's at least that's what i try to do awesome thank you um we'll take a moment and i'll give you some time if you would like to raise your hand and ask a question out loud um, you can do that by on the bottom of the Zoom bar under reactions, there's an option to raise your hand and then I can see you and I can unmute you and give you permission to speak. Or if you have a question that is still rolling around your mind, feel free to type it in the chat and we'll take a look at it. Ooh, and I see Kira has a question first. Hey there, thanks so much, Tara and Taylor. Um, earlier, I wanted to find out if you felt that the visual communication uh, that happens in uh, our design, if you would relate that to user interface, I sometimes have a hard time uh, seeing information on user interface. And I think it's maybe because it's being used with other kinds of vocabulary. This is a great question. And it was actually something that came up in my uh, in my mentorship with a user experience designer, I was I was really getting focused on the UI elements of kind of my fake project, um, and so there is a there is a distinction between user experience and user interface, and most of the time, unless it's a custom interaction like interaction uh, design in Storyline or something like uh, Adobe Captivate, the interface is sometimes out of our control so like rise or an lms the, the the way that it's designed we often have limited options for customization and we're just finding ways to make it work uh so for example for rise you can't change the shape of the buttons and so if if we were thinking about you know designing the interface we'd, we'd we would get to customize those those options so in terms of visual communication, I think information architecture and visual design can really come through even in those spaces where we have limited options. Um, if you if you do have those options and let's say you're building a course strictly in Storyline or only in Adobe Captivate, you kind of have more options to dig into what your interface is going to be and making sure it's consistent between like your different slides or things like that. Um, but if you're using like a templated tool, most of the time, the interface is what it is. <laughs> does that does that answer your question? Oh, she's muted. Yeah, mostly. I uh, I, thank you, Tara. Uh, Tara uh, reshared my question in the chat. So do you think you could call visual design synonymous with the user interface that you have control over then? I would say yes, there is there is overlap for sure. I think user interface, you have to pull visual design in, you have to pull accessibility in, you have to pull, you know, even information architecture to an extent. So I think user interface is a lot of different things and it and visual design is definitely one of those things. Thank you. Great question. Awesome. We probably have time for one more question. So I do have one more in our list, but if anyone has a live question that they are burning in their brain, um, <laughs> feel free to either raise your hand or put it into the chat. Ooh, this is a good question. So this person is currently studying learning design or learning education and technology enhanced learning, looking at becoming a UX designer in the real world working um, what are some of your best tips in getting the career started? Another great question. Um, there's a couple of things I would say for best tips. I'm not a UX designer, but I do pull a lot of uh, what I do from 
you know, user experience. I would say first look into those different communities like Dribble and Behance. There's this other one on LinkedIn I follow. I think that's called like UX Planet or uh, something else. But there's a lot of, you know, the, the field of user experience design is very youthful. It's very new um, in the sense of like a lot of careers that have been around a very long time. So there are some really awesome communities and even people on LinkedIn that kind of, you know, might be interested in, you know, offering a mentorship. Some, some people on LinkedIn are like, hey, do you need help with this thing? Um, I found a mentorship to be really helpful, but just testing out different tools and projects even if you don't have, let's say, finances to like play around in Figma or one of the like wireframing tools that user experience designers use, use Canva or PowerPoint or even Wix is like a website builder that you can use templates. It's free, but you can kind of start to play around with building different websites um, and kind of go from there. But I would definitely, for best tips, start to build out your kind of portfolio, play around in these different tools that allow you to build websites or apps and look to different communities to, to get started. And some certification programs, if, if you can, you know, or some like free online courses. Um, I took a, I took some on Treehouse was the uh, platform that I used and it was really helpful. Yeah, that's awesome. And that's a great opportunity to network too. Not only are you going to learn some things, but you'll have a chance to chat with e with other people. So um, one of the things we love to do at the end, the end of these sessions, because it can, you know, you're on Zoom, you're on the computer, are you even with some other people, um, is we like to let you unmute and just say thank you or goodbye all at one time. So it's kind of chaotic, but fun. <laughs> and so I've given you the permission, you have the power to unmute. So feel free to say thank you. And I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Taylor. Thank you, Tara. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Isn't that fun? <laughs> I absolutely love that. Yes. Awesome. Taylor, thank you so much. This was so great. We'll spend some time building. And again, with the holiday, we'll probably need at least a week to create the courses. Usually it's a lot shorter. Um, but you know, with everything going on. Yeah. So yeah, so definitely feel free to send me um, the resources that you thought of during the session and I'll make sure to add them into the course. Of course. Okay. That, that sounds great. Awesome. Um, and there was one question, what's the name of your website? And um, I'll just plop in the Eduflow Academy link into the chat again for you. I'm not sure if that's the one you're asking about um, Vio's iPad, but um, <laughs> Eduflow Academy um, Eduflow is an LMS that where you can build courses really easily. And I must say, I have a lot of pride in my team's design of how it's very simple and very aesthetically pleasing. And, um, yeah, and there's options to make it your own when you're designing a course. Um, you can actually design courses for free on the free plan, um, and invite up to like nine other users. And, um, so it's really, really a great place to, if you're just looking to try something out, but, um, the webinar is more from the Eduflow Academy side of things. And so that's where we have some instructional design courses, have some L&D courses, um, a great opportunity to see Eduflow because we use Eduflow to create those courses. So feel free to check those out. Yeah, yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> awesome. Okay, I'll shut yeah. down our Zoom. Have a wonderful day, Taylor. Thank you and happy holidays to everyone who celebrates. Have a have a wonderful uh, rest of the year.